Hello and welcome to another episode of the Radio Times Doctor Who podcast, aka Doctor Hugh. Uh, yep. I'm keeping it going. It's going to happen. The people will speak out. Yeah. Uh, I am the semi titular Hugh Fullerton. I am, unfortunately, Stephen Kelly. Yeah. Uh, and this week, after long promising it, I know you've all been waiting, biting your fingernails. Uh, we're actually going to talk about the new series, Writers. Uh, so this has been a, a funny a funny thing this year because obviously the episodes were written a very long time ago. Filming's finished. But we only found out really recently who the new writers were. We always knew that uh, Chris Chibnall, who's the showrunner, would be writing the lion's share of the episodes. But we didn't know who, what else was going on, You know whether there'd be a sort of writer's room. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we do all know all that. So, um, Stephen, do you want to introduce some of the new writers? Some of the new writers? Yes. Uh, so we have... Obviously, we have Chris Chibnall as yep. head writer. The big dog. The big, <laughs> the big dog. As he insists on being called. He, he does. <laughs> he every doesn't. every story he emails in, he <laughs> writes letters to the Radio Times. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the biggest one we have is Mallory Blackman, mm-hmm. who is best known for novels like Noughts and Crosses and Pig Heart Boy. She also, uh, fun fact, she wrote a short Doctor Who story called mm-hmm. The Ripple Effect. Have you read it? Uh, I have not. But I've I, read it. But I have I know enough about it to yeah. talk about it convincingly as I, I, I have. I, coincidentally, when it was, she was announced, I had it on my desk because I have the um, 13 Doctors. It was part of a compilation of short Doctor Who stories, mm-hmm. uh, which they did for the 50th anniversary. They got loads of established authors to write little short stories. And she did one for Sylvester McCoy's Doctor. Mm. And they sent me it. So I had it on my desk still. So I pulled hers out and read it. And it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's about Daleks, right? <laughs> it's like, what if the Daleks had always been nice? Basically, I really like that. I really like that idea, because I remember you you telling me something about it. Like it, it sort of plays into the Doctor's own prejudices. Prejudice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because it's the sort of point of the story. Um, for anyone who hasn't read it, is the Doctor's like, well, we need to fix everything, and then uh, Ace, his companion, is basically why you know yeah. the universe is fine. The Daleks and the Time Lords getting along. It, what just because you don't like the Daleks, why can't you let them be this force for good? And it kind of resolves itself in a slightly different way because. It's still a children's book, but, um, it, but it's it, an interesting question. It also has interesting parallels, not to go on uh, about this too long, because we'll be here introducing the writers all day, Yeah. but it also has interesting parallels with um, Noughts and Crosses, which I read a very, very long time ago. Um, and that's set in a world in which uh, white people are basically take the role, the social role of black people. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's sort of, it's exploring racism, like as if like, you know, it's uh, swapping it around, like, and it's a really interesting way of tackling that huge issue, I suppose. Like, there's, there's like a really like, I think there's a really poignant bit in it. Like, um, I'm probably remembering this really badly, but there's like, like, uh, plasters are not, new, are not new, uh, they're not just automatically pale right, for I white see. skin. Oh, they're, right. In the same way that um, a lot of uh, people of color have problems with. Um, Makeup and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. In our, in our so world, yeah. you know, she's she's very good at that sort of stuff. That's really smart. I mean, she said um, she's talked a little bit about. We should sort of say um, there's a kind of funny thing this year where the writers, the writing team, have sort of worked together, but mm-hmm. also they do have individual responsibility for specific episodes. So I think basically they've sort of come together, talked about them, helped each other with ideas, then gone away and written yeah, them, and then come back. I mean, we don't know the exact details of it. I mean, it's sort of modelled on an American-style writer's yeah, room, but, but I don't think it's exactly the no, same. No, I, I, asked, I asked the BBC, and they basically said it's not quite that. It's somewhere in between. It's kind of special Doctor Who magically done way of doing it. It's just more collaborative, say. I imagine. Yeah, basically. Um, and her episode, she's described as heartfelt, thought-provoking, and timely, which kind of definitely ties in with kind of what we know about Mallory Blackman, the sort of things she likes mm. to talk about. And also, I think she's, she said a little bit in, uh, in this interview, which was with Doctor Who magazine, um, that she kind of liked the idea of playing with the conventions of Doctor Who a bit. Yeah, Which yeah. is kind of what we saw in her short story. Um, and that's great, you know. Like, it's really, really good to get people in who don't typically write Doctor Who. Yeah. Because they always have interesting takes of, of where to, of what, of what to do with it. Well, totally. I mean, I think everybody, apart from Chris Chibnall, is a newcomer to Who. I mean, Mary Blackman is probably the closest any of them are to actually having written for Doctor Who. That's true. Also, we didn't mention this, but um, it's sort of a mad fact, but she and Vinay Patel, who's the um, one of the other new writers, they're the first ever uh, writers for Doctor Who who aren't white. Mm. Which is which makes sense when you think about it. Not as, you know, as in like when you actually think, oh, of course that 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 is true. I've known all these writers; they have all been white, but I just never thought about it. Yeah, it, it, when 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 that was announced, uh, it was like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, 
um, I saw a lot of people very, very shocked. Uh, you just don't, I think it's something that maybe if you're privileged enough to not worry too much about that, you just don't think about because the debate for so long has been, are there enough women writing Doctor Who that I didn't even consider the race issue for such a long time. Yeah, and um, I mean, this, 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 uh, this issue is, was particularly quite hot during Stephen Moffat's years for various reasons. Yeah, there was just quite a long period where there weren't any women writers. Yeah, and he got he got criticised for that quite a lot. Um, you know, for, some, for good reasons in some places, but I feel like he was well-intentioned in, in other places. And I think he said in Doctor Who magazine at some point that he he, he sort of believed in this sort of free market idea that it, mm. the talent will always rise to the top and stuff. Yeah. And then he just... And then he said, oh, actually, that's not true at all. You need to actually give people You need to chances, give people a chance. Which yeah. feels like this is what's happening here. Yeah. Um, moving on swiftly from Mary Batman, uh, one of the other new writers who I just mentioned is uh, Vinay Patel, uh, who is best known for writing Murdered by My Father, which mm -hmm. was, I think, I don't think it won, I think it was BAFTA nominated, uh, BBC Three uh, drama, which is really excellent if you haven't watched it. It's, it's still on BBC iPlayer, I think, yeah. for UK listeners. Um, and he's described his episode as educational, epic, and emotional. And it's one of these interesting things, actually, because it's quite easy when you see these writers to sort of jump to it and say, oh, they've probably written an episode about this because we've got mm. a, someone here who will talk about a minute who wrote for Skin. So it's like, oh, this will be an episode about young people. And that's not true because no. everyone can write everything. Like, um, Vinay Patel is also a playwright and he's, you know, he's got a play that's just come out at the minute. And obviously, Mary Blackman's written loads of different stuff, like massively different stories within her, like, novel work. Um, but, you know, we can sort of educational, epic and emotional. It doesn't sound a million miles away from... You know, he explored religion and race to an extent in Murdered by My Father. Mm. It doesn't seem like a huge leap to suggest he might do something similar. Like, that's presumably the project that got him on the map for the Doctor Who people. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, um, this is also another huge change, uh, just to digress uh, very uh, briefly. This is also another huge change in, in how uh, Christian has approached this to Stephen Moffat. Cause Stephen Moffat's uh, philosophy used to be that he wanted showrunners. Mm. He wanted people like um, Toby Whithouse. Toby Whithouse. Mark that's, that's the name I was thinking of. Like huge, huge, huge names. <coughs> um, because he believed that it, I think it, I think it was part of his sort of idea that he wanted Doctor Who to be taken seriously as a creative right. force. I like this. I, I'm quite interested in this approach um, because yeah, you should give chances to to the guy who wrote Murdered by My Father because it's obviously very. It's it's obvious that he can write. Yeah, definitely. You know, what could he do within that sandbox, which is Doctor yeah, and also what kind of stories could he tell that haven't been told before by a pool of writers that has had, I mean, anyone can write about anything, but a pool of writers who've had a sp rather specific set of life experiences, mm. which his might be different, or his perspectives might be a bit different. Um, but then it's, it's you know you can't also say just because he wrote Murder by My Father he's going to write something equally as sort of serious. Well, totally. I mean, look, the thing is, the next writer I was going to mention, uh, Pete McTy. I'm not sure if it's McTy or McTe or McTiggy. I don't think it's McTe. You um, never know. <laughs> but, you, you don't, but I don't yeah. think it is. But I mean, so he's best known for uh, creating and writing Wentworth, which is a uh, really really popular uh, Australian prison drama, which won loads of awards. Mm -hmm. But he's also a massive Doctor Who fan. Like he writes for sleeve notes for classic DVD releases and he did yeah, a yeah. wrote a sketch for the you know Peter Davison re-release they just did but went on YouTube the same day as he was announced as the writer that went up. And so if you just look at his work you'd be like oh you know maybe he'll do quite this quite sort of serious thing you know maybe he'll talk about gender issues or something stupid. Um but you know he's a he's actually a, got this whole other side to his personality that he's only now going to unleash on Doctor Who and it could be that so many of them have these like sci-fi ideas they've been holding on to or something that would work in that realm like uh, back to Vinay Patel he said that he's a huge Quantum Leap fan mm. you know and he you know loved all those sort of things watching with his dad when he was a kid so who knows what these things could be basically my point is that a lot of our discussion is a bit pointless <laughs> yeah we know nothing we're just fumbling in the dark here trying to fill fill dead air yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to keep doing it um, <laughs> whether you like it or not yeah so um, until morale improves we've got two more uh, writers uh, Ed Heim who we mentioned earlier mm -hmm. uh, so he's best known for working on Skins mm -hmm. uh, and he has also done quite a lot of play work quite a lot of the people interestingly this year are from non also write non-TV stuff as in Mallory Blackman's obviously a novelist quite a few of them are playwrights Joy Wilkinson's a playwright Ed Heim's done some play stuff Vina Patel's done some, play, some playwriting which is kind of interesting like it kind of bring, might bring a different feel to it Yeah, well, who knows <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows well you know writing plays uh 
know many many TV writers are playwrights. Dennis Kelly, who wrote Utopia, he was a playwright. Oh, of course and, he was. Um, yeah. Dominic Mitchell, who done In the Flesh, and obviously you have the the big one, the big dogs like Pinter. So like David, David Hare, who did uh, TV stuff also. David Hare did like yeah. page, page eight and all that. Um, Ed Heim, speaking of which, um, he called his episode really rather spooky. Um, That's good. Uh, Pete McTie, who I didn't mention earlier, he said his was uh, a creepy, fun roller coaster. Hopefully not literally, although that'd be quite cool. <laughs> He's giving it away. Um, and then the last one we're going to talk about is uh, Joy Wilkinson, who is, um, she's worked all over the place, basically. She's done, uh, she did a really critically acclaimed thing called The Adventures of Nick Nickleby, which mm. was a kind of, it's like, twist on Dickens I, I think um, and she's worked on like Casualty and Doctors and lo- done loads and loads of plays she's got a play on at the minute um, which is about uh, historic women boxes or something um, and she's described her episode as dark funny and squelchy which is interesting I hope that's a plot point and not just that it was raining yeah because the director I remember I read in one of the I think it was I think it might have been Dr. Magazine but they said that um, filming was hit by uh, by rainstorms by and stuff. rainstorms and stuff it Probably is. Boo. But um, I hope there's a really squelchy villain. Well, it's all like, you know, the words are like creepy, dark, spooky. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you would the vibe we've sort of got for this series is that it's like fun, family friendly, you know, back for the kids. But quite a lot of the writers are like, actually, this is about a really big issue. Yeah. Or this is quite scary. But the thing is, you can't confuse family friendly with like, you know, it's not going to turn up. And be bananas in pajamas. Or no, something. I suppose you got to look at even something like Adventure Time, which is kind of for younger kids, deals with some quite like sophisticated stuff, right? Yeah, like family friendly means you know, um, it it basically just means you know, family friendly to me to 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 use a Star Trek analogy is like you know the next generation and all those sort of things. Not family friendly is the new series of Star Trek Discovery, which is just has loads of sex and swearing and stuff. stuff. So yeah. it's not going to go that far, but anyway, it's it's going to be spooky because it's yeah, and like do. Star Trek and Next kids Generation. love kids love being scared. That's they the do. Thing. I mean, that's the thing about Doctor Who, isn't it? Like in the announcement for the um, they when they announced the new air date for uh, this series of Doctor Who, Chris Chibnall still evoked the whole hiding behind the sofa thing, which mm. is the thing most people. That's like a link everyone makes with Doctor Who is hiding behind the sofa from the Daleks. Like that's the thing of Doctor Who. Yeah. So you're right. I mean, they're probably just. It's probably just a continuation. Hiding behind the sofa is weird, isn't it? Like, who doesn't have a sofa against the wall? Yeah, it's like how would you do it? You'd have to pull out the sofa. Like most people I know have a sofa sofa against the wall. Well, I think it. I think the origin of the phrase. I think I read somewhere once. I could be completely wrong here, by the way. Is that Tom Baker told a group of school kids that he finds Doctor Who so scary that he hides behind the sofa? And, he and that would make sense because Tom Baker definitely has a sofa. Uh, like in the middle of a huge gold So, room. I mean, I have, not to be, not to kind of come off as two flash guys, but I have two <laughs> sofas in my flat and um, one's against the wall and one is sort of against the kitchen. So you could theoretically hide behind one of them. I haven't yet, but... Right. But I think most families... Just have it against the wall. Would have to maybe jump out the window. To be fair, like my when I was growing up and watching, you know, Doctor Who or whatever, like we had sofas against the walls. This is possibly not... A discussion <laughs> we should go into too much depth in hindsight because there's one final writer sorry my voice has changed i've regenerated there's one final writer like it there's one final writer uh chris Chibnall. he's writing yes. or he's mainly responsible for writing about half the episodes of this series which seems like quite a lot but actually the first series Russell davis did he wrote eight out of 13 mm. and stephen moffat's first series he wrote six out of 30 so you know it's sort of about half is seems sort of reasonable um, and he's actually someone who's written quite a lot of Doctor Who before. So we can actually glean he a bit more from him. has, yes. <coughs> you have some thoughts, Stephen. <laughs> I, I wouldn't describe them as thoughts, but... Um, <laughs> wouldn't go that far. It wouldn't go that far, I don't think. Uh, the thing with Chris Jimmel that I think has... I think people love everything about this series. I think the, the, the one uncertain element is Chibnall himself. Mm. And... Um, I think the reason for that is purely because with Russell T. Davis and with Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat maybe to uh, a greater extent because we already had a flavour of his stuff through Blink and, you know, Science of the Library and his voice was so distinctive. Like, it's one of those things you know when you're watching a Stephen Moffat thing. It's very quippy. Uh, it's very, you know... Yeah, that's the only word I'm going to use to describe Stephen well, Moffat. It's, it's quite like <laughs> it's plot. Quippy. It's quite plot heavy. It's got a lot. It's it's plays around with. He, he just has a, a he just has a voice, you know. And um, 
I never, I never really got that with Chris Chibnall. He does, none, none of his episodes, like, I don't think you could ever really describe anything as like Chibnall-esque or anything like that. I Nothing think, really jumped out. I think me. the two that are Chibnall-esque for me are um, Power of Three and... Is that because of the family stuff? Yeah, and yeah, also yeah, yeah. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship to an extent. Yeah, that that is that like because but but that, but then that's like really reading into it like yeah like you you, you you could you could spot a Moffat episode from miles away yeah it, you, in its broadest power strokes. of three could have been a Russell T Davis episode for example yeah and like Russell T Davis has had his own sort of uh, tone which was mu- which was much more warmer much more you know uh, when his characters spoke they actually sounded like real people yeah. Uh, Whereas Moffat preferred to go a bit more hyper real, and F one was very super smart and stuff, and both of those had their pros and cons. Um, with Chibnall, he seems to like families. Yeah, he seems to like. Well, I'm, I'm basing this purely on Power of Three, but also maybe um, Dinosaurs and Spaceship. I, one of the things is that I do like is that he likes um, to explore the realities of being a friend of the Doctor. Yeah. So I like I like the idea of power of free of, of him like crashing around to their sofa and and like Amy and Rory trying to figure out their life. And it stuff. felt like a new perspective because there's always been touches of it like in um, the first series with Christopher Eccleston, you know Billy Piper accidentally goes away for a year yeah, rather yeah, than yeah, a yeah. day, and um, you know then you see the impact that has, but you don't see it as it's happening. You see kind of the aftermath mm, when she mm. goes back. Whereas this is kind of yeah you see it from the companion's perspective, the Doctor dropping in and out. Um, also you know I. It's interesting because it's like you say you can read into something too much because you can look at Bradley Walsh's character in the new series and be a bit like oh that's a bit like Rory's dad who was yeah, played by yeah. Mark Williams Brian who is like also a middle aged man who's kind of dragged along which is kind of what we've been led to believe is happening with Bradley Walsh's character but also like that might not be a conscious choice it might just be that it's a char- the sort of character he likes writing yeah I mean all all writers have characters that they like to write over yeah. and over again I mean just look at Stephen Moffat's companions also we haven't seen the series so we don't you know maybe Graham Bradley Walsh's character is completely different but what, what this just suggests to me though is that um, that maybe Chibnall knew this because he's he, he knew that he uh, with the writer's room format the show because he doesn't because ha- he doesn't have as strong of a voice or or as maybe Moffat or T. Mm. Davis does, and you know that's no bad thing because sometimes they got to a point in the for the, in the Moffat era, for example, it's like you know living with someone for too long, <laughs> and you become kind of fed up with them. Yeah, and um, and uh, yeah, it's um, I feel maybe like he 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 implemented the writers' room. Because he knew that he didn't want this Doctor Who to be swamped or overwhelmed by uh, one personality. He wanted it to be more of a collaborative. Collaborative, and you know, I quite like that. I mean, that's not to say that's not to say that's not saying like, oh, Chris Chibnall has no has no voice, so he had to farm it out to other people. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that he 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 just didn't want the whole thing to be, you know, defined by one person. Mm. But also possibly by having them all collaborate, he does make it kind of a consistent story yeah. in a way that it might not have been because the way they used to do things was that they would sort of f- have, write the arc but then farm out scripts to freelance script writers who would work with the showrunner but they wouldn't like interact with the person who was writing the next episode yeah. necessarily and occasionally you had the old like continuity thing because of that at the moment we don't know what episodes these people, the guys are mainly responsible for and we've still got loads to learn about their episodes but um, they're an exciting bunch of writers from Chris Chibnall, Mallory Blackman, Vina Patel, Joy Wilkinson, Pete McTie, if we're saying that right, and Ed Heim. Hmm. Uh, and hopefully in the weeks to come we'll find out more about the episodes. Uh, but that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, yeah. I am, as ever, Dr. Hugh, Hugh Fullerton. Yeah, you are, aren't you? <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm Stephen Kelly. With apologies to Pete McTee. Yes, <laughs> and um, if as ever, if you want to read more analysis on Doctor Who and the new writers, you can check it out on RadioTimes.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.